السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاه والسلام على رسول الله وعلى اله وصحبه So now the black people in the audience, now you know your origin? <laughs> <laughs> Amazing, huh? <laughs> this is on? <coughs> but, so seven minutes, and with that seven minutes, yeah. The next, and that's why you, the Mormons, when they come to you, it's so, it's so easy to start with that. They come to you, have you heard of the Church of Christ of Latter-day Saints? Yeah, absolutely. Aren't you the one that believe that, uh, you know, that God used to be a human and lived on earth and will become gods and immediately look down. And then, you know, the high point and low point. You come with the low point and come with the high point. So the minute someone you know, that tells us they're ashamed of it, we start to invite them to Islam. So instead of them giving you that, well, you use that, so when they're in that state of shame, you're the one now giving the talk. You're the one giving the doubt. Don't be the one who is the mad'u. Someone with this belief system is giving you that. Uh, uh, let's see here. Um, I wrote something else here. And someone asked me a question. I said I'm going to mention it to him. Uh, okay, uh, someone, someone asked also, yeah, that was one question, and there was another question. Yeah, great. Um, the, the question was about effeminate men, you know, effeminate men. They're not gay or anything, they're just effeminate, you know. They have loose joints, the wrist falls freely. Um, they, sometimes some of them use women's cologne and things like that, but they're not gay or anything like that. Uh, in Sudan, for example, a lot of cooks are effeminate. And most of the time the cook is just talks like a woman, uses a woman's perfume, but is not gay. You know, it doesn't feel affection for men or anything like that. They're just effeminate men, and they used to exist also at the time of the Prophet said, no, just a guy who's just a softy, you know, very soft, and likes the company of women, and so on and so forth. They um, don't necessarily fall into the category of, of gays, and thus they start doing that kind of activity, and they become gay. But also, there's, uh, uh, there's also like, uh, the, the and, and it's not gay, that's why when they try to argue, there's something called Klinefelter syndrome, which is basically, as you know, the male has two X chromosomes, I mean, uh, sorry, the female has two X chromosomes and the male has an X and a Y. So this is, is a genetic disorder where they have two X's and a Y. So X, X, Y. So they've got X, X, which is to make them female, then, but they've got an X, Y. This is the kind of person that you see who genetically was born like this, and you might see uh, a, a man slash woman, like someone with Klinefelters, they will have, uh, let's say, male hands, like hairy hands, big fingers, and then they'll have, like, um, you know, mammary glands, let's say, and then they will have, uh, you know, something male and something female, and you might be confused. And they're not someone who went through an operation and tried to change or anything like that. They were just born like that. So if you ever find someone trying to use that as an argument to say, look, it's genetic, they're not gay, these people. They just see, have both genes. And uh, some, their personality will be one or the other. Like uh, I interviewed one person who had Klinefelters, and he was a male, and he was married, and he was taking other hormones to just keep his the feminine um, uh, physical part suppressed. But he was actually a male, and he had the, and sometimes it's an, the opposite, it's a woman, but then she's got, you know, the, the man hands or the, or the hair and stuff, or something like that. It has nothing to do with gays, yeah. so they're not gay. Yeah, Shiraz? What, uh, it's a, I forgot which one, which one it is, either transvestite or transsexual, the one who is, like, uh, naturally they, they have the, uh, their genitals right. are, it's like a mix of male and female, what about them? Uh, what about them as far as their ruling, yani, or did they classify as gay? They're ruling. Uh, they're ruling in the hereafter, yani? or are they ruling as, like, as far as going to men's rooms or, or the like, women's restrooms? Yeah, like what would they be considered here and uh, can they marry and things like that? Uh -huh. Well, you know what, I, I've never looked that up actually. I've not, not encountered anything like that. Uh, so has anyone looked that up in like Islam QA or something like that? Yeah? Yeah. Uh, it's always about the, the concept, right? Uh, mm -hmm. That 
these people, I mean, uh, like, like some of them, uh, like, they're actually like sexually not active, right? So, uh, and uh, it was like halal for them to like uh, walk them onto women, you know, uh, who, who don't wear hijab, and then and the ruling is that be feminine, you know, man. Be feminine, man. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. and okay. and, and, and uh, it's actually. Halal. I was talking about trans. Yeah, the, the transvestite, and, and like, and like, they have the option uh, uh, to choose like which sex they actually want to be, and they, they can take like which hormones they want. They can have mm -hmm. surgery if they want. And that's all like had uh, out. Okay, I'm still confused. Then. Not that you didn't explain one, but uh, but uh, look, let's just uh, let's just do this. Let's move on. <laughs> And uh, the, the people, because I, I'm not sure where we're talking, like there's a, there might be an effeminate man, and he's just a male who's effeminate. He doesn't have the right to change, uh, you know, and to, to go through operation to try to become a woman. And if that does happen, is he allowed to enter uh, the women's restroom? He would be probably allowed, because he's an effeminate man, to, to enter upon women more so in a way than the male would be allowed. Because at the time of the Prophet Sallam, there was a man who was effeminate, and, uh, and he used to sit and talk with the women. The Prophet allowed him because he was effeminate. But then, when the Prophet realized that the man pays attention to, to female physique, the Prophet said he would not enter upon women again. You know? So he made a description, so he's actually one of those who looks at the woman physique, even though he was effeminate. So the Prophet forbade him to, to sit with the women after that. Um, then there's, I mean, there, then, because now, you know, the world is so mixed up. We've got some really, really extreme cases. A friend of mine was telling me about his boss who used to be a male. I'm just, it doesn't get worse than this. He was a male, went through operations and hormones and surgery and became a female, and then became a lesbian. <laughs> <laughs> and he went back to liking women. Could have stayed a man and liked women. I mean, it just doesn't get worse than that. So, obviously, that's beyond me, those those kinds of things. I don't know how to answer that. They, you know, I would uh, look it up in Islam QA or the or the harass Sheikh Walid Basuni or something like that. <laughs> okay, Salah. So we said Allah does not need us to worship Him, but Allah says, "Wa kharaftu jinn wal ins illa liyabudun." So someone might ask you, "Well, why did He even command us to worship Him?" So can you explain that? Why should we worship Allah? Then? Sure, He commanded us. I understand that. But why did He even command us to do that? Yes, sir. So can he just create us and then we don't have to pray? To be thankful for what he has given us. Can I be thankful without praying? I'm, I'm not saying it's a valid argument. Yeah? Because we need it. Because we need it. We need it's it. It's true. I mean, and that was true at Umar and that was true as well. I, I wanted to see, the, uh, see which, which of uh, his creations are obedient to him and which ones are not. Okay, so you can link it to obedience and disobedience. Yes, what do you do when, like, when there are bad times? You, you go back to worship God, right? Okay. So what would be assessing of what the person who went there is good. All right. So, so in the bad times, it's, it's something you fall back on, worshiping Allah. Please raise your voice, brothers, so the sisters can hear. It's along the same lines as we're just saying. It's a mercy. It's not like a, it's not a chore. It's a mercy. The prayer itself. Uh-huh. To get to Allah. Awesome. Allah, brother, saying it's not a chore. It's a mercy. Very good. Yes, sir? Um, this is a question. Okay. Kind of tell you the premise of it. Uh -huh. This basically the premise is that what's what is humor for him in creating us? Like, why did he create us? Like, why uh -huh. did he need to create us? Like, for enjoyment or suffer a lot? Of, you know. Right. Why right. did he create us? Uh huh. So why did Allah then create us? I, I don't know, but could you answer the question? Is uh, we're created. That that's the fact. Uh huh. And where do we go from here? Not. Oh, what if we're not right. Where'd you get that from? I could have gotten it from CDF. Oh. <laughs> Every time you quote something exactly like I say, I'm like, hey, because you mean you could have been thought of it, right? It's not like I made up every argument. So, excellent, very nice. So the brother is saying, you know, sometimes, what if someone keeps pushing it with the wise? Why should we pray? Allah commands in the Quran. Why? You explain. Why? You explain. Why? You explain. Why? You explain. When you run out of explanations, now what are you going to do? You're going to fire back at him. You say, look, this is what's going on. This is the situation. What are you going to do about it? That's the question. What are you going to do about it? We're here, and we don't know all the whys, 
But Allah is there and we're here. What are you going to do about it? That's it. You bring it back to the Dawah. But okay, let's, let's push it with the wise until we have to stop. Someone else? Someone new? Ahmed? He's the creator. He creates. Okay. Now, by the way, don't, please don't quote this hadith. It's, it's not authentic. A lot of times I'll ask that question and someone put his hand up. Kuntu Naam? I'm going to say it now. They'll say that Kuntu Kanzan La U'araf Aratu An U'araf Fakharaktu Al-Khalq Fa'araftu Hum Bi Fa'abaduni Something like that. It basically it says I was a treasure that was not known. I wanted to be known. So I created people to worship me. And it's just not authentic. Don't use it. But as, as some scholars say that Allah Azza wa Jal yani, uh, yani Allah Azza wa Jal is so magnificent and so great that He is deserving of being worshipped deserving of being appreciated and that's why we look at the numbers of angels the phenomenal, phenomenal numbers of angels and they're constantly worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala non-stop they don't stop to eat or drink or talk non-stop some of them since Allah created them and Allah knows when that, how long that has been. They've been in non-stop worship until the Day of Judgment. And when the Day of Judgment comes, they will say, Oh Allah, we haven't worshipped you enough. And you know the hadith of the Atat al-Sama, where in the hands, and the Prophet said, the heavens have creaked. And rightfully so that they did creak. So we're talking about the heavens, the seven heavens. Not just, you know, our universe, so, you know, all of space and everything that's within the first heaven, the worldly heaven. So this is just the size of the first heaven, and then the second, and the third, and the fourth, and the fifth, and the sixth, and the seventh. And their vast size, Prophet said they creaked from the weight on them. It is rightfully so that they did creak, for there is not a hand span, just from here to there, there's an angel standing, or, bra or bowing, or prostrating in prayer. So here, I mean, in just this room, you fill every hand span, there's a person here, 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 here. What if we fill this whole city? Every hand span, there's someone. What if they fulfilled the whole continent, the whole planet, we're talking the seven heavens, loaded with angels, constantly standing in, in either bowing or prostrating or, or you know, standing in prayer. Prophet said they have been doing so ever since Allah created them, and they will continue to do so, quality and quantity, until the, the trumpet or horn is sound on the day of judgment, they will say, oh Allah, we have not worshipped you enough. All of this, so far be it, and from us to pray and then feel arrogant, oh, no, just pray to Allah, no. That's why the Prophet taught us to say Astaghfirullah. The first thing you do after Salah, Astaghfirullah three times. Why? You're saying this Salah that I just completed is not befitting the majesty of Allah, the greatness of Allah. These angels have been worshipping this excellent quality. They don't think of anything else. And they would say, we haven't worshipped you enough, Ya Allah. So Allah Azawajal is so great and so magnificent that He's deserving of being worshipped, deserving of being recognized. And, and some people try to explain just like when they say, like when you have, let's say, you know, for the sake of, of uh, an example, and it's not a comparison to Allah Azza like when you have some like vintage and, and or let's say classical car that's in superb condition, you know, like very oldy but it's in excellent condition, and if it's in your garage constantly, it's not appreciated, right? So they, that's why they have these events when they bring them, just so people can come, the public can come and look at these cars and stare inside. So they can be appreciated. Yeah? Some scholars tell you then, some of the, yeah, the attributes of Allah will be manifested when there is a creation. Like for example, the Rahmah of Allah, it will be manifested, meaning applied, when there is a creation to show the Rahmah to. The Khalq, it will be manifested when there is a creation that, that, to create, and so on and so forth. And uh, the wisdoms and all these other things. So you explain it like that. If they keep pushing it with the wise, and you're going to run out of explanation, then... You turn it back and say, well, you know what? Now you've run to, we've, we've reached the point where my knowledge is limited and you can't expect any human being on earth anyways to go that far into knowledge. The question now is, you know, it's the truth. You know, Allah exists and you're here. What are you going to do about it? You just now get back to your da'wah again. Don't always take the position of you ask, I answer. You ask, I answer. Yes, sister. Uh, so uh, it's like 
we are the same kind. We are angels. Uh, we are have uh, we have the fuel, and this is why Allah uh, is releasing when we make tawbah to Him. Allah is releasing with this because because we are going to Him with our free will. Exactly. The, the second thing is that we are created from materials and that is blood and uh, bones and so and and spirit and the materials are fit with uh, water and uh, and food and so but spirit can only be fit by Allah mm -hmm. by worshiping Allah. You mean you did that. excellent. Everyone understand? Exactly. Thank you very much, sister. Bye. Um, I want, to, I want to talk about the flip side of the argument one more time, or to explain it a, a little bit further, right? So I said we can always use the flip side of the argument to explain something. We used it with the intervention and how much or what the bad things happen to good people, what the good things happen to bad people. There are also other ways to do it. So for example, let's use it with a Muslim now. So one Muslim will tell you that, and you've heard Muslims make this argument before, They'll tell you that, uh, don't say that Allah is on his throne. Some Muslims will tell you that. Don't, don't, don't make the argument that Allah is settled on his throne. Even though Allah says that in the Quran, they'll tell you, no, he's not on his throne. Look at their argument. When they make the argument, it sounds like it's very respectful. But when you push the argument, what are we doing here? But when you fix the argument, uh, when we, okay, when, let's just... Uh, so basically they're saying, don't say that Allah is on his throne, because that way you're limiting. See how it sounds good? You're limiting Allah to one place. Don't say Allah is on his throne. You with me? So, their argument is, you're limiting Allah. And it makes it sound like you're trying to be very respectful here. And it sounds good in the beginning. But then when you flip the argument around, it's a big, big problem what they're saying. So they're saying, don't say Allah is on his throne. You say, Tab, Allah said he's on his throne. Ar-Rahman al-Arsh is Allah is settled on his throne. So now in order to, to stay with their, their argument, they have to now twist and change the meanings of the Quran, which is the first problem they get into. So when you say Ar-Rahman al-Arsh is Allah has settled on his throne, they say, no, istawa here means istawla, which means like he conquered his throne, which now brings us into a big problem. You're saying Allah conquered the throne. That means there was someone there on the throne. So he had to conquer it from them. See how, many, how they fall into problems because of their argument. So they're saying, don't say Allah is on his throne. You're limiting Allah to one place. Like, let me flip this around. You're saying, if he's on his throne, he's limit, physically limited to one place. If I flip it around, it means he's physically everywhere. everywhere. That's the opposite. And that is a bigger problem. You're trying to fo follow, leave this, you know, you're trying to avoid being disrespectful, you actually fell into it, even more so. When you flip it around, it means he's physically everywhere. And then you ask him. So here you can use analogy, but we're flipping the argument still. So they're saying that physically everywhere means he's everywhere. And he would have in, in the church, in the restrooms, bars, all these places that you wouldn't be caught dead in. And you're saying he's physically in there. And historically, Muslims have gone astray with this because that some of them even wrote poetry saying, يعني, يعني that the, the dog and the pig is nothing but our ilah. The dog and the pig is our God. Why? Because the dog takes up space, the pig takes up space, and God is everywhere physically. يعني, that means also inside them. And so is the, the monk in the monastery. He is our ilah. One of them said, you know, he said, you know, I don't know which is the, uh, I don't know which one of us is the ilah and which one of us is the mukallaf, the one who is supposed to worship the other. Another one says, subhani, subhani. Did he say subhanallah? Subhani, because Allah is in him, that what he believes, you know. So, when you look at the flip side of the argument, it's a bigger problem. They were trying to respect Allah and say he's not on his throne because that limits him to one place. But you flip it around. You're saying he's everywhere in places that you wouldn't want to be caught dead in. And then you're saying he's inside you know, all these things. So you get into a bigger problem. So you flip the argument around. This is the same thing that happened at the time of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. When they said the Quran was created. 
So they again tried initially to be respectful to Allah Azza wa Jalla. They said the Quran is not the speech of Allah. Why? Because speech is renewable, and Allah Azza wa Jalla is qadim, meaning like ancient. He's been there for for, for the, ever. So if you say Allah speaks, that's a renewable quality, and Allah is ancient or qadim. I don't know how to translate qadim beyond beyond ancient. So they're trying to respect Allah, but the problem is when you flip their argument around, that's what Ahmad ibn Hanbal did, when you flip the argument around, we have a big problem now. Because you're saying the Quran is not the speech of Allah, it's something created by Allah, and all the creation of Allah and everything besides Allah is imperfect. So now you're saying the Quran is imperfect, and it has flaws in it, and everything has an end, and you're saying now the Quran has some kind of end. And that's one of the arguments that Ahmad ibn Hanbal used when he tells him that, you know, I came to make wudu and I came to pray and I couldn't recite any surah. And then I looked in the room and I found the Qur'an dead on the floor. So the Khalifa got upset and said, does the Qur'an die? He said, well, you said it's created and everything that's created has an end. So they were high then. So, they, I mean, he used the knowledge and everything, but when you flip the argument around, you see that it's a big problem. So that's the benefit of using the flip side of the argument. That's why someone, when they say, like, um, you know, I don't believe in organized religion. For what it's worth, I love throwing in the word disorganized. This is so they can think about the flip side. I don't believe in organized religion, so would you prefer a disorganized one? And I know that's not what they mean, but they say no. No, I mean, but then you, you get them to think of the flip side. And what do you mean organized? I mean, what do you want? You want something that's not organized? You want it to be your way, whatever you, way you feel like? Yes, sir? Uh, he's, they're saying that the Qur'an is not the speech of Allah, it's something created by Allah. And he and he's arguing with them that everything created by Allah is imperfect. I mean, only Allah is perfect. All, the, all His creation is imperfect. And things, so that means the Qur'an would be imperfect. Two, everything that's created by Allah has an end. That means you're claiming the Qur'an will have an end. And he gave them the analogy of the Qur'an died last night. And they got upset, like, how could you say it died? So well, it's created and it has an end. So it ended yesterday. So, uh, and then and he used many other arguments, many, many other analogies. He also went into the Qur'an being the knowledge of Allah. So then he argues with the, the, the Khalifas to send him uh, people to debate with him. So he would argue with them. He would tell them, is the knowledge of Allah created? So one of them says yes. Because if he says no, he has to prefer, extend that argument to the Qur'an. So he had to say yes. So Imam Ahmed tells him, Kafar, and you're a Kafar. How could you say the knowledge of Allah is great? So the guard, when, when he is just a simple guard standing there. He doesn't know these scholars are debating. He doesn't know who really he can't follow. He doesn't have enough knowledge. When Imam Ahmed tells the man, you become a Kafir, so the, the guard gets upset. He tells him, this is the messenger of the Khalifa. How can you call him a Kafir? So Imam Ahmed looks at this simple guard. He tells him, he's saying that Allah's knowledge is created. So that means that before Allah created his knowledge, he had no knowledge. And how could he create his knowledge if he didn't have knowledge? So he said the guard just started to give that guy the mean eye, you know. He started to stare at the simple guard, so how could you say that, you know. So he kept reversing these arguments, giving the flip side, giving the flip Anyone heard the biography of Imam Ahmad? Oh, that's a small number of people. Oh, man, that's a small number. The biography of Imam Ahmad is just... Unbelievably phenomenal, unbelievably phenomenal. You've heard it by uh, Sheikh Safi Khan. Yeah. yeah. Have you heard? Does uh, Hisham Al Awadi do it? No. Okay. <coughs> actually, I actually have it. It's like six hours, but it's not produced anywhere. If somebody wants to take it and edit it and put it online. Go ahead. I'll, I'll give it to you. It's so phenomenal. It's so 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 phenomenal. It's so detailed. It's heartbreaking. You laugh. You cry. You everything. It's just. And what a hero, what a man. And you, and you love him because you see that he was afraid at times, but he encouraged himself. And, Yahi, man, started. Because you know what the scholars, the historian and the scholars say, that Allah saved this religion with a Siddiq on the day of a Ridda and Ahmad ibn Hanbal on the day of the Fitna of the, or the Mahna of the creation of the Quran. Why Abu Bakr and Ahmad ibn Hanbal? Why are these the two greatest stances in? Islamic history according to scholars. 
Because there are many times when, the, like the Mongols, the Tatar invaded the Muslims and they destroyed their and, and libraries and so on. But Islam itself wasn't under any threat of changing. You know? Just Muslims were under the threat. But Islam was still okay, the religion. But at the time of Abu Bakr, he stayed steadfast and he preserved Islam from... They said if, he, if Abu Bakr didn't stand steadfast, today we would have an Islam without zakah. And if Ahmed ibn Hanbal didn't stand steadfast, today we would have uh, an Islam where the Qur'an was, a, was created and not the speech of Allah Azza wa Jal. And then the, oh, the arguments that he used were so phenomenal. And every time he would stop them, they would add more chains and bricks to his chains. And, and then they would beat him, then they would trample him. They would put something on top and they would all walk over him and they would knock him out. And, and he's a thin, frail man, but he's just... And see, in the beginning, I, I know I'm getting into that, it's just beautiful. Man. The beginning, there were a lot of scholars that were on his side. Then they were threatened with jail, threatened with the swords, only nine remained. Then they were threatened again, only the seven of the nine said, Khalas, we'll say what you want us to say. Only two remained. Imam. Uh, Ahmed ibn Hanbal and a young man named Muhammad ibn Nuh. Just this young man, just these two people. The Khalifa said, send them to me. He says, Wallahi, I'm just going to kill them. So a man came in crying. He said, Ahmed ibn Hanbal, the Khalifa, has got the sword. He pulled it out and he's going to kill you. Um, Ahmed prayed two raka'at, raised his hands up and he made dua. He said, when he put his hands down, he heard some screams. The Khalifa had passed away. Anyways, such a phenomenal story. I hope uh, you read it. That was a preview, you know. <laughs> Coming soon. Uh, anyways, where are we? We're talking about the flip side. So you see, you flip the argument around. Flip the argu I did it with the beard guy, right? Why do Muslims grow their beard? I basically, in a nice way, told them, why do you shave? You know? Uh, like, so, there was a speech being given by a Muslim speaker at university. A woman came in all angry and yelling, non Muslim woman, pointing at the sister's section. Why are they covered like that? So he tells her, well, I mean, you were born unclothed. Why are you covered now? So she said, modesty. He said, well, modesty. More modesty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you cover yourself for modesty, that means the more you cover yourself, the more modest you are. Using the flip side of the argument, and, and don't really use this, but it's the flip side of the argument. If someone tells you, uh, you know, like a woman argues, you know, these women are covered and so on, and, and uh, they're not liberated. The argument is that the more uncovered you are, the more liberated you are. And you could argue, but don't do it. You could argue, well, I see that you're still not fully liberated at the moment. Why don't you liberate yourself some more? <laughs> so, but, you know, it's using the flip side of the argument. If covered is, is uh, oppressed and uncovered is liberated, well, just be 100% liberated then, you know? Um, of course, don't use the argument, you know. Uh, sometimes people try to use a fact or a statistic the wrong, just like we saw. They tell you, yeah, you know, you know some, some zebras are gay. So, suppose that was a real fact. Would that mean that we should be like that? No. Sometimes they tell you something is natural, you know. Like there was a, this atheist guy with me at work, and again, don't do this. I'm just showing you the guy who was being very aggressive. So I just came to something of equal measure, where he said, and I'll get to you, sister, inshallah, I see you. So the, he was arguing aggressively, he just really hates Allah, hates Islam, and he thinks he's so upon the truth, you know. So he was saying that, you know, uh, he was talking about, you know, women flaunting their sexuality and, and just, and it, like that, and, and I kept telling him that it's not appropriate, and he was saying well, it's a natural thing. So his argument was that it's natural. And then my counter argument is that not everything that's natural should be done publicly. And people argue a lot of times to tell you it's natural to be like this. Or that's a natural feeling that I have. So yeah, it's natural. Do you do everything natural out publicly and you talk about it publicly? So I told him, oh, okay. So I actually told him, uh, and, and because of the situation and the level of aggression, so I said, I mean, it's natural to have a bowel movement, so stand on the table right now, and you pull down your pants, and have a bowel movement on the table. <laughs> and, and he was stumped immediately, like, because it's natural, but you don't do it like that. So don't tell me it's natural to have urges, and therefore, and every, just like these people who argue with music, they tell you well, it's natural to like music. A child will listen to music, he'll start jumping up and down. It's natural. 
Yeah? Well, every teenager has urges. That's natural also. It's not like they, they bought it from a store. It's a natural urge, but does it mean it makes it okay? Some people try to argue if it's natural, that means it's... If it naturally happens to you, that means it's halal. No. So you counter it like that. So sometimes they, they use the logic, but in the wrong place. Yeah. And, uh, and there are many other things that are natural, but you don't do uh, publicly. Or you don't even talk about them publicly. But we've got like 10 minutes left, right? Um, in, in 10 minutes left, let's talk about uh, quantifying arguments. Okay, that's another technique. You get them to, to not arguments, but statements. Get them to quantify their statement. So, okay, so let me... Someone tells you, you ask someone, you know, do you know anything about Islam, you like to become Muslim? He tells you, no, because I'm actually very happy being Christian. Someone says that to you. Where do you go from there? Hmm? <laughs> huh? Where do you go from there? Go wherever you want to go. You're the diet. Ahmed. What do you mean by that? Uh huh. Someone else? That's it. That Ahmed just said. Where'd you get that from? Good. Excellent. Yeah, very good. What do you mean by happy? You can't. He actually answered it. He answered it. You have another question? But let me finish this point. And I forgot about you, sister. I'm sorry. I'll come back to you. But look, if someone tells you, I'm satisfied being a Christian, I'm happy being Christian, you can't argue this statement at all. You can't argue the fact that he's happy. What are you going to say? Don't be happy. I don't want you to be happy. Or let me make you happier. You can't argue about happy. You know? You can't argue happy. You can't argue satisfied. You know, lawyers use this thing. Any lawyers in the audience? What do you people study in here? Huh? You study law? Why don't you put your hand up then? You study law. Okay. <laughs> okay. Like, so, uh, yeah, they, they use this technique. Well, someone says, yeah, I was a hard worker. So they can't tackle the fact that you're a hard worker. So they get you to quantify what hard means. So uh, let me say, did you work, uh, you know, eight to, to eight to nine? Or what is it, nine to five? Yeah. Say, yeah. And did you work Mondays through Fridays? Yeah. Did you take some Fridays off? Yeah, every other week I took Fridays off. Did you take Saturday and Sunday off? Yes, I took Saturday. So basically, you basically worked Monday through Thursday, and then the next week, Monday through Friday. Yes. Okay. So they quantified it. So when someone tells you, I'm satisfied being Christian, don't tackle the fact that he's satisfied. Get him to define what makes them satisfied. So look at this scenario here. Someone tells you, I'm satisfied being Christian. Now, instead of saying, don't be satisfied, I'll make you more satisfied. No, just say, okay, what makes you satisfied? What gives you this feeling of satisfaction because you're Christian? He will, example, he'll say, well, it's, the reason is that uh, I'm satisfied because uh, Jesus died for my sins. Do you have something to work with now? Listen to me, listen to me. Don't just put your hand up. Listen, do you have something to work with now? Yes. yes. Now you can work with the fact that Jesus died for your sins. I have something to, to work at and to tackle and to analyze. But I can't tackle the fact that he's happy. I can tell him, what makes you happy being a Christian? And he could say, well, it's the fact that X, X, X. And now you can tackle that, that point. You can't tackle the fact that he's happy. Get him to explain what makes him happy. Get him to explain what makes him satisfied. Make, you know, things of that sort. So that's how you... Quantify an argument. If something doesn't make sense and you don't know what that means, always ask for an explanation and then get to the root of what makes them feel a certain way. Okay, sister? I'm just, what your earlier point was the question is modesty. And sometimes when you're talking to non Muslims, they ask, well, why are you so modest? Because they don't want to be seen as modest. Okay. Okay, you guys get the question? Yes. Now, how do you answer that? Men are supposed to be modest. Yeah, that's true. Men are supposed to be modest, but there are more regulations on the women. Why so? Why more on the women? Uh -huh. He created them differently, and he made, for the most part, sometimes these laws don't apply now because people have become strange, but he made, for the most part, that the, the beauty of the woman is in her appearance. And she, the woman, will 
يعني be a fitna or a temptation for the man when he sees her يعني the fitna of the woman is when the man sees her and that's why Allah made her cover up uh, herself so she does not become like just an object and so on and so forth but uh, the women are not as effective by uh, as affected by attractive men as, a, as men are attracted to so the problem with this thing, this was an old argument, but the problem with it now is that, and this was you know, something weird that we discovered, that uh, you know, the scholars of old used to say that one woman can tuftin, be a temptation for a hundred men, but a hundred men couldn't be a temptation for one woman. That's what they used to say back then. And it was true. But now, you know, you hear this stuff about, you know, you know it's changed now. Let me just say that. It's changed. Yeah, and it, I don't know if I want to even get into this stuff. There was, there was a masjid in one area, I won't say where, where uh, one brother, his wife, told him that the sisters uh, in the salah, they're excited about sujood time. I mean, I was shocked when I... I it was very difficult to make sujood in that place from that point on. It was, yeah, and it, you wouldn't expect that because we used to argue that you know women are not attracted to them by looking at the man, and that's why the lowering the gaze is harder upon the man and it's more obligated on the man than the woman. But of course, the rule is that if the woman is, is, is you know, excited by looking at the man, then she has to lower her gaze. If a man is excited by looking at the woman, he lowers his gaze. If a man is excited by looking at anything, he lowers his gaze from it. And if you have a vase in your house that's shaped like this, and that vase excites you, don't look at it. <laughs> that's really the rule. I'm serious. I understand that that brother has serious issues, but that's the rule. <laughs> well, why the scholars even mentioned that if, if a man is, is, if he sees a young boy, that makes him, don't look at the young boy. You know? You know the guy sees a zebra and he doesn't want to don't look at the zebra. Whatever it is, don't look at it. That's the rule. I'm serious. So, <laughs> anyways, but. The point is that the, the chance of the woman being a bigger fitna physically is greater. So, that, and then, so Allah put her beauty and also physically, and that creates a huge fitna. It can, you know, um, um, 10 million men now can become you know, muftunin from looking at one woman. That's why the obligation is stronger on the woman to cover, because as the brother said, her butt in you know, a different physically, and so on and so forth. Uh, and so. Uh, so just uh, try to go, I know there was this kind of scattered argument, but just try to go somewhere uh, along those lines uh, of explaining why uh, there's more of an obligation to cover. That's why also, and you find sometimes like the hadith where the Prophet ﷺ says that if the woman, you know, she does her five prayers, she fasts her months, she obeys her husband, she guards her private parts, she go to paradise from any of the gates that she wants to. Now, you, you look at... And then sometimes sisters object, oh, what, you know, why is the, when you explain that, why did Prophet mention the woman guarding her privates more so? Because the scholars explained that, that she, she is the, yeah, what's the word, yeah. She's the one that will determine if that happens or not. And if the woman says no, then no, no sin will happen. And so the sister put her, well, well, the man is also involved. Yes, I understand that. But the go-ahead, the green light or the red light comes from, from the woman. And so that's why she was given that honor, that if she protects her private part, she could enter paradise from any of the, the gates that she wants. So we have to look at it from, uh, in Islam, this is really beautiful, they tell you that, the scholars say, that if you, if you, uh, and you consider two, two things that are different, if you treat them exactly equally, that's injustice. If you have two things that are different and you treat them exactly equally in every aspect, that's injustice. True or false? Yeah. Right? And if men are different from women, we have to treat, there has to be different treatment. If I say, okay, this sister, I treat her just like she was a man, you know, then I'm being unfair here. Sure, on a human level, this is a one soul, this is one soul. It's not like this is one third and this is a full human being. No. On a human level, they're exactly, yes, equal. But when it comes to other things, they're different. So you have to treat them differently. And that's why the Sharia has made different rulings for women when it comes to this, and different rulings for them in, in Ramadan, in, in childbirth, because there's a difference between them. Don't accept this argument that, well, the man can do this, the woman can't do that. And this is part of the problem with the radical feminist movement. Not the feminist movement, the radical feminist movement. They argue what the man did, why can men do this and we don't do that? 
They, their goal in life is to be just like the man. So if the man is a boxer, we have to box. If he drives a, a you know 18 wheeler, we have to drive 18 wheelers. If he's a firefighter, we have to be firefighters. If whatever the man does, that's what we aspire to become. And this is not the, the goal that Allah put for women, that they just want to be exactly like the man. Who said that the, the end result is to be like a man? Uh, the opposite. So I said, I'm cursed the women who resemble men, the men who resemble women, because each one is different. So that, that's why, because of the difference of women, because of how Allah created them, there will be more of an obligation upon them to cover up than upon the, yeah, upon the men. Right? Anyway, uh, I don't think there's time. I think it's actually 1 o'clock. We have to stop. We reconvene at 1.30. Uh, 2, 2.30? Oh, yeah, 2.30. Two, that's an hour and a half. Dabna khayrat Allahumma barakam Muhammad. Allahumma sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Assalamu alaykum.